Hello, my name is Dr. Beth Cudney. In this video, I'd like to talk to you about process capability. Process capability is an important aspect of a Six Sigma or any continuous improvement project because it helps to describe the inherent variability of a product characteristic that you're trying to improve. And process capability helps to represent the performance of that process that you're trying to improve over a period of stable operations. And what that means is before we go through and we calculate our process capability, we should know if our process is in a state of statistical control. With process capability, we're comparing the voice of the process, which is the data that comes directly from the process, with the voice of the customer, which are specification limits that should be given to us by our customer and provides us information on our customer's expectations and requirements. And then we use that information as a measure of how well our process is operating with respect to those customer-driven specifications. Process capability represents the performance of our process when it is operating in that state of statistical control. Process capability is calculated from the total variation that comes from our common causes. And before we calculate our process capability, we want to be at the point in our process improvement efforts that we have minimal variation because we've eliminated the special causes within our process. And at this point, we should only have common cause or natural variation within our process. So let's take a step back and look at process control because it's important to understand how that impacts our process capability. Process control only refers to the voice of the process. It's again determined only from the data that comes from the process and it does not take into account our specification limits from our customer. And when our process is in control, it forms a stable distribution over time. And what that means is our mean and our standard deviation are not shifting. The data from our process is consistent, and therefore the mean and standard deviation are consistent over time. Process control is achieved by eliminating special cause variation. Therefore, our process is in a state of statistical control when only common cause variation is present within our process. Dr. W. Edwards Deming is noted as the father of statistical process control. And one of the, the most notable quotes that relates to process control is, but a state of statistical control is not a natural state for most processes. It is instead an achievement arrived at by elimination, one by one, by determined effort of special causes of excessive variation. So now let's take a look at process capability indices. These are dimensionless numbers, and what we're doing with our process capability indices is comparing the variability of that process characteristic we're trying to improve to the customer-driven specification limit. The most commonly used process capability indices are CP, CPK, and CPM. Let's take a look first at the CP index. The CP index is known as a process potential measure because it's only dependent on the standard deviation. It does not take into account the centering of the data. CP is calculated by dividing the upper specification minus the lower specification limit by six times the standard deviation. And our denominator gives us information on our natural process variation because we're taking into account the variability within our process. So let's take a look at it in other terms. If we look at our numerator, the upper specification limit minus the lower specification limit, that's the voice of the customer. These are customer-driven specifications, so this is the first part of the ratio to understand how our voice of the process matches the voice of the customer. And in the denominator, we're looking at six times our standard deviation, which is the voice of the process that tells us how much variation exists within our process. So if we look back at the voice of the customer, this is our tolerance, and we're dividing that by our natural process variation. So in simple terms, we're looking at a ratio between our voice of the customer and our voice of the process. And if our CP is equal to 1, that means our process is technically capable because the voice of our customer and the voice of our process are equal to each other. But if we think about the distribution, then that doesn't give us much 
really wiggle room and it doesn't give us a nice tight distribution. If we look back at the ratio, if our CP is 2, that means the voice of our process is half the width of the voice of the customer. So that means we have a nice tight distribution of our data. And a CP of 2 represents Six Sigma performance. It's important to note that CP does not take into account or represent centering. And therefore, even if our CP value is equal to 2, that does not mean that we have a good process. Part or even all of our process variation could be outside of our specification limits. So let's take a look at what different CP values mean. When our CP value equals to 1, that means the width of our process equals to the width of our specifications. And as we further improve the process, our CP value grows, and when our CP value equals to 1.67, the width of our process is even smaller than the width of our specification limits. And after we further improve a process with a CP value of 2, that means that the width of our process is half the width of our specification limits. But again, it's important to note that we're not taking into account process centering. And therefore, even though we have a nice narrow distribution with a CP value of 2, a process with a CP value of 2 could actually be outside of our specification limits. And therefore, it's important to take into account two key aspects of our CP value. The higher the CP value, the better, because that means we have a narrow distribution. And the second key aspect to note is that CP does not take into account centering. Therefore, even if you have a CP value of 2, which means you're operating at a Six Sigma level of performance, you could still be producing bad parts because your process may not be centered. The CPK index was developed then to address process centering. And it takes into account the proximity of the process average to the closest specification limit. And CPK looks at the proportion of natural tolerances, which is 3 sigma, between the center of the process and the nearest specification limit. When we look at the CPK calculation, it's very similar to the calculation for CP, but now it takes into account the process average. CPK equals to the minimum of the CPK upper or the CPK lower. When we look at the calculation for the upper process capability index, CPK upper equals to the upper specification limit minus the mean divided by three standard deviations. And the lower process capability index equals to the mean minus the lower specification limit divided by three standard deviations. And by taking account the mean of the process, we're now able to take into account the centering of the process. The common goals for CPK are 1.33 or 1.67 because they allow for some process drift. And we can convert the CPK value into the sigma level by multiplying the CPK value times 3. And what we're trying to accomplish here is that six sigma level of performance. And what we mean by six sigma is we can fit six standard deviations between the mean of the process and the closest specification limit. And what we're trying to achieve with Six Sigma is a process that's centered on the target with minimal variation. So now let's take a look at how we would calculate CP and CPK. Let's consider a pharmaceutical company that's manufacturing beadlets for capsules. The particle size of the beadlet is 600 plus or minus 30 microns. Data on the process indicates that it's normally distributed and a control chart shows the process is stable. The standard deviation of the process is 17.05. Beadlets from a random sample of 30 batches have shown that the sample mean is 603.44. We want to take this information now and determine the CP and CPK. Using the information from our pharmaceutical example, we can now calculate CP and CPK. For CP, it's equal to our upper specification limit minus our lower specification limit divided by 6 times our standard deviation. In this example, the upper specification limit is 630 and our lower specification limit is 570. The difference of these two values is in divided by 6 times our standard deviation, which is 17.05.
and that gives us a CP value of 0 0.59. Since the CP value is less than 1, that means our process is not capable. And if we consider the formulas that we discussed previously, that tells us that our process variation is considerably bigger than the width of our tolerances. And so we have too much variation within our process. Now, since it doesn't tell us about the centering of our process, we still need to calculate CPK. The CPK upper is calculated as the upper specification limit minus the mean divided by three times our standard deviation. The upper specification limit is equal to 630 minus our mean of 603.44 divided by three times our standard deviation of 17.05 and therefore our CPK upper is equal to 0 0.52. Now let's calculate our CPK lower, which is equal to our mean minus our lower specification limit divided by three times our standard deviation. Our mean is 603.44 minus our lower specification limit of 570 divided by three times our standard deviation of 17.05 which gives us a CPK lower value of 0 0.65. For our CPK, we're taking the minimum of our CPK upper or our CPK lower because we want to determine which one is closest to the specification limit. And in this case, the minimum of 0 0.52 or 0 0.65 is 0 0.52, which tells us that our CPK value is also not capable. Now we can compare our CPK to our CP value to see if our process is centered. And in this case, comparing the value of 0 0.52 to 0 0.59, we can tell that our process is slightly off-center. We can also compare the minimum values of our CPK upper and CPK lower to see if our process is centered. And if we compare 0 0.65 to 0 0.52, this also tells us that our process is not centered, and this tells us that our process is running towards our upper specification limit. Now we can also look at this graphically, and using software such as Minitab, we can create a histogram of the beadlet size that shows us the mean of our process of 603.4 and the standard deviation of 17.05. And from the histogram, we can tell that our process is not normally distributed, and it actually appears to be a bimodal distribution. We can also look at a summary of the beadlet size using Minitab, and that provides further information such as the mean, standard deviation, variance, skewness, and kurtosis, and our confidence intervals for our mean, median, and standard deviation. Two additional indices that are commonly used in conjunction with process capability are the process performance indices, which are PP and PPK. And these can be used when the process is not in a state of statistical control, and they're typically used in situations such as new product launches, where you do not have enough data to show that your process is in a state of statistical control. And because it's typically used in situations where you have new product launches, and you do not have a considerable amount of data, PP and PPK use smaller sample sizes. And so the indices may appear larger than their corresponding process capability. And therefore, you need to use these with caution. Another important term is CPM, which is the process capability index of the mean. And it's useful because it accounts for the location of the process average relative to a target value. When we looked at CPK, we were taking into account the average of the process and the specification limits, but our target may not be on center, and we're not specifically taking into account how the average of the process or the mean of the process relates to our specific target value. With CP and CPK, we were looking at the standard deviation. Now we're looking at the difference from each value from the target value where the standard deviation takes into account the difference from each value to the mean. Thank you for watching this video on process capability. I hope it helps you in understanding how to use process capability to improve your processes.